So what is neuroethics? I mean, what is this thing called neuroethics? What are you preparing to teach? And I think for different people, it's going to be different things. It's going to be, you know, some of you may be particularly concerned because of your students' needs with um, issues that pertain to responsible conduct of research, right? And that can be everything from, you know, um, predictive testing for Alzheimer's, you know, should you share the results with the patients, to, um, uh, I just had a, another one, um, which I have, which has just left my head. Um, but, uh, you know, others of you are gonna be, um, Stephen, I don't know if your course is more oriented towards clinical neuroscientists and, you know, sort of issues that come up with, you know, are you, are you abandoning your, um, you know, Hippocratic Oath when somebody says, can I have some Adderall, you know, even though I don't have ADHD? Or are you fulfilling it because you are helping them lead a, you know, lead the life they want to lead, whatever. So there are going to be, um, there are going to be sort of, uh, this is a little bit of a, you know, sort of menu. You can pick the sections that you want, leave others out. But it is quite a wide swath of uh, landscape. Um, let me just ask you, let me go around the room and ask people to like name an issue that they could definitely see themselves teaching. And if it's not just totally obvious why, um, uh, just tell us briefly why. Um, so uh, I'm going to put poor Jesse on the <laughs> spot again. Um, um, well, from, from what I um, said in my introduction, I, I am very closely uh, focused on the questions of narrow law with my own research um, that, that has substituted use neuroimaging tools, predominantly uh, fMRI, to, to weigh in on questions that might be um, very practically applicable in legal settings and forensic investigations. So I, I've never taught this to undergraduates or graduate students in the context of a neuroethics and neuro law uh, course before. And I uh, thought it would be useful if I was developing a course to contextualize these neuro law questions in a broader framework for, for thinking about um, neuroethics and how we can evaluate um, just the, the uh, moral and, and societal and legal issues um, and try to see how different kinds of, of um, neuroimaging or neuroscientific research tools um, can, can weigh in on these questions and, and what we would want to study from a uh, scientific perspective to see um, what what these techniques are capable of, what questions one would need to, to ask about their reliability and um, inferential power before they could be used in, in practical issues that would have impacts on people's lives. So as far as a, a course, I wanted to, to be able to engage students and have discussions um, that would uh, raise these issues and let, let the students sort of chime in on their perspectives, but to be able to do so with the right um, structure and rights sort of topical coverage. My, my interest is, is not just on offering a neuro locker course per se, but trying to um, go into all these, these topics that you highlighted, the um, issues of, of enhancement, uh, free will, and sort of brain made me do it, um, defense, and, and issues of addiction, and, um, uh, culpability, and, uh, and so on. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. That's great. And let me also mention that you needn't highlight issues that I just reviewed here. Um, one thing that I would like to do is, um, in the course of the week, if there are areas of neuroethics that I didn't mention here, um, I, I can try to like find some good readings and stuff. So at least, you know, send you and your colleagues off with. Uh, readings on on those topics as well. Um, so, in fact, you know, maybe I'll even I, I made some quick notes here on topics in neuroethics that we're not covering this week. 
So one, you know, one is kind of the neuro backlash more generally, and this might be relevant to you know, Eric's teaching in a science and technology studies program. It's more sort of like history of ideas and you know, is there anything really new here? And uh, you know, what, what, what is this uh, malignant meme you know, that everything has to be neuro? Um, uh, then it really in like no particular order. Um, some of the issues that arise with implanting gadgetry in people's heads, okay, deep brain stimulation, brain machine interfaces, there's a lot in the news about these lately. I think there really is a tremendous progress being made. I mean, awesome. Like, you know, in, in, in psychiatric drug development, there are essentially no new ideas. You know, there are no kind of eagerly awaited new treatments in the pipeline. Um, and a lot of big drug companies have pulled out of psychiatric drugs because, you know, it's just not clear where the new ideas are coming from. At the same time, people are finding new ways to help patients with psychiatric diseases using deep brain stimulation. It looks like it's really quite effective for certain patients, you know, under certain circumstances. So there's a lot of excitement there, you know, all the more because drugs are not looking very promising from here on in. So there's a very steep gradient in kind of learning about the effects of DBS and the promise of DBS. Um, at the same time, uh, surgical innovation is a little bit of a sausage factory. You kind of don't really want to know, you know. There, it's, it's regulated in, uh, surgical innovation is regulated in a very different way from um, drug research. Uh, basically, once the um, stimulator itself has been FDA approved, the surgeon can put it anywhere he or she wants. Um, so there's a lot, there's a lot less formality, a lot less review in this process. There are some sort of cowboy types, um, I think more in Europe than here, uh, um, exploring DBS for you know pretty questionable indications. Um, but, you know, fascinating, fascinating neuroethics topic. Um, people have studied kind of personality changes as a result of DBS. I mean, it's a very different kind of side effect profile. Um, so, DBS um, and brain machine interfaces as well. Um, oh, conflict of interest with, you know, academic industry ties. That's a very generic bioethics issue. But in fact, you know what, poor, I, I'm probably gonna end up yakking for a lot of the remaining time, but, but it, I think it is worth getting some of these topics out on the table that we're not actually gonna um, cover here. You'll get a little bit on the academic industry thing from Rob Derubis talking about depression treatment. It does end up being more of an issue for neuropsychiatry than for other fields. You can speculate about why that is. Um, some people have said it's because psychiatrists are the most poorly paid physicians, and so they're just much more easily manipulated by payments from drug companies. I mean, I, you know, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if anybody really knows. Um, but uh, there is, there, there is some kind of dirty laundry that has come out over the years, you know, hearings by Charles Grassley and various investigative reporters um, about academic industry conflict of interest and the way in which it distorts the results of research and from there distorts clinical practice. And it does, it's not confined to brain illnesses, but it's disproportionately found in, in neuropsychiatry. Um, you know, especially the, you know, the antidepressants, the antipsychotics. Um, so I think that could very legitimately be considered part of a neuroethics course. 
Um, uh, there's a whole range of pediatric neuroethics issues. There are special, um, th there are sort of new complications introduced to all of the enhancement ethics questions when the individuals being enhanced are children, frequently being enhanced at the behest of their parents or their teachers. Um, because it's much easier to teach a classroom of kids who are orderly and attentive and you know the Adderall will help kids be that way even if they are not really by most people's you know judgments uh, ADHD oh my god it's terrible the antipsychotics and kids yes yes yeah and peace peaceful as a lamb and um, there was a story maybe six months ago showing that among low-income children in America, I, I can't remember the numbers, but a, a truly um, tragic fraction of them are being treated with antipsychotics. You know. Anyway, um, so, uh, so there are these, these special issues about um, psychopharmacology in kids, which actually Eric has done a wonderful study of with various colleagues, and that will definitely go in the reading list. Um, and um, also, from the sort of child development uh, point of view, there are, you know, there is um, a sort of, uh, uh, what is, Ruth, Ruth will be able to answer this question. What the um, people who talk about being neurotypical or what, what is the other thing that they're kind of proud of being? Oh, Asperger, Aspies. Aspies, yeah. Okay, so, you know, there is a hugely um, expanded rate of diagnosis of people on the autistic spectrum that may change as a function of DSM-5 now. But um, what's interesting is that in some cases, these kids and grown-up kids and families of kids um, object to having these traits considered an illness or a disability, they are proud of their differences. And they talk about, um, uh, you know, the neurotypical world and then their kind of more unique brains. Um, so there is a, a social identity that goes with this, um, as well as all kinds of issues of um, uh, you know, sort of public health and resource allocation and so forth. So I think that again. Um, oh. Something special in a positive way. You mean? Yeah. treatments yet, but, you know, we may see something a little bit like, you know, deaf culture and, um, you know, deaf parents who object to the idea of, or, you know, parents of, yeah, usually deaf parents and deaf children, you know, not wanting their children to get cochlear implants, wanting their kids to live life as, they don't want anybody to, right, because they see it as a kind of cultural genocide, you know, they have this culture that is very meaningful to them and they don't want to be able to hear. They also want the death gene. Okay. They want the death, death gene implanted into their parents. That, that there know. actually have been such requests? Yes. Wow. OK. So you know, interesting um, possible precedent for some of this uh, you know, Asperger's pride movement. Um, uh, there are issues of mental privacy and how that plays out in the law, um, and you know, is 
information obtained from a brain scan, from a functional scan, is that, um, is that evidence or is that testimony? Okay. Um, various other kinds of issues surrounding um, mental privacy that we want to talk about. And also kind of related to neuro law but won't be covered here is what you could call neurocriminology. Um, we're learning more and more about the biological factors that predispose people toward crime, genetic factors, experiential factors, both of which have effects on the brain that are increasingly um, detectable in brain scans. Um, we're very far, obviously, from a minority report kind of situation where you can sort of say, this person is going to commit a crime. Um, but we can certainly put uh, you know, confidence intervals around that now. And they're big, but they're going to shrink as we learn more. So you know, what about uh, screening people? Okay, preventive detention would be a little extreme given the size of the error bars now, but what about screening people to then offer them therapy or to then monitor them more carefully? Um, you know, that strikes many people as a terrible, um, you know, unwarranted invasion of privacy. On the other hand, from a purely consequentialist point of view, you know, I suppose if you did it, there would be fewer victims of those people's violent crimes, you know. So if, if you don't want your kid to be raped or murdered, you know, maybe you should be in favor of that, you know, just putting that out there to be provocative. Um, so screening, um, I think, will become uh, an issue uh, in the neuroethics of crime. Um, we, won't, we won't be specifically talking about that. And what goes along with screening? You know, intervention. Right? What, once you've screened somebody, what do you do? Well, we already know that um, SSRIs reduce impulsive violence and they reduce sex drive. I mean, that is, that is a problematic side effect for people using them for antidepress you know, as an antidepressant. But if you are trying to uh, reduce the likelihood that a sex offender will recidivate, that's, that's the effect, that's the main effect, that's not a side effect. Um, you know, should, should people be given, you know, depot Prozac? Um, should uh, people be, well, and people are already given um, involuntary hormone treatments, which again, reduce sex drive. Um, that works on this organ as well as other organs. Okay, so that's a neuroethics issue. And with, you know, progress in not just psychopharmacology, but brain stimulation, implants, you could imagine a kind of clockwork orangey um, scenario. So um, those are just you know, a handful of topics that we won't cover here, but I think could easily be put in a neuroethics course depending on your student body and what they want. <laughs>